Breaking news. A Sony full frame camera has leaked and it is exactly what we've been waiting for, a budget friendly camera to take on the Canon R8 and the Nikon Z5. We have a $1.8 trillion lawsuit. A photographer who fooled everybody using AI portraits and several new Nikon Z mount lenses. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. No matter what type of website you need, the right place to start is squarespace.com slash Tony. Could be for business, it could be for a personal project, whatever it is, get your own unique domain name. Create an Instagram, but use that to drive people to your website where they see your best work, your most recent work. You can take appointments, sell products directly, view detailed analytics so you know who comes and who leaves, so maybe you can chase them down. To get started, go to squarespace.com slash Tony, and when you love it, the coupon code Tony gets you 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace, our top story. A popular Instagram photographer with 27,000 followers was a total fraud. All the portrait images were actually AI generated. And as I scrolled through his feed, I thought, this is obviously AI. How did this fool anybody? All the traits are there. The skin is just a little bit waxy. Everything is just a little bit too perfect. But I have to put myself in the place of somebody from October 2022 when he first launched this page. Would I recognize it as AI then before AI generated images were really on my radar? And I'm not sure because I was so innocent and doe-eyed at the time, I might have just assumed the best. And now I'm hardened and skeptical and I'm looking for signs in every image I see to see if it's AI generated. So they can't fool me now. But when you look through the comments like this one, You've got all the stunning models coupled with your stunningly captivating skills. You, you see that people assumed he was creating these portraits. And he did lie in his early profile and just specifically named the camera that he was using. So they had every reason. Most honest people assume other people are also being honest. Did he do something wrong? Well, he's fully disclosing it now. He said it was a project. We wanted to see how people received it. I'm going to say this is a good thing because now we're a little bit more aware that photographers can do this. And I imagine we'll start to see portrait and wedding photographers setting up just traps for people to send in deposits based on amazing AI generated imagery. We'll probably see this a lot. We'll see people trying to build followers on Instagram using their amazing photos even though they're all AI generated. And that's gonna make it more difficult for all of us who insist on generating images the old fashioned way with our digital cameras. This is bad news for many of us, but it is especially so for stock image agencies like Getty. Getty is a massive organization that employs thousands and thousands of photographers who are constantly taking images and feeding them into Getty for all the different organizations that subscribe to Getty, like news organizations, to be able to pull images and publish them as part of articles. Like the sports images you see here, if the local news team wanted to run a story about the World Cup, they would probably license some images from Getty so they don't have to send their own photographer there. Makes sense, right? This particular AI image tool, uh, Stable Diffusion, used these Getty images to train its AI creator. And there's very obvious evidence of this. When you ask it to create images, it will often build the Getty watermark because that's what it learned the images were supposed to look like. So obviously they used these images from Getty against the licensing. So they literally stole it and Getty controls their intellectual property very carefully. So they're suing them for 1.8 trillion, which I don't even, I can't even comprehend that amount of money. What they do is they basically uh, assign a certain value to each image stolen. And then if the AI image generator parsed a million photos, they will multiply that value times a million. So that's why they arrive at such a big number. They're definitely not going to pay 1.8 trillion. Stable diffusion is not worth 1.8 trillion. But, but maybe they'll settle for something less or maybe the company will just throw up its hands and file for bankruptcy and flee. Nonetheless, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out now that it's challenged in court because we've brought this up several times. AI is generating images based on your image. It is stealing your style, not just learning from you, but actually stealing your bits as shown by the fact that the watermark was copied. And this doesn't feel right to me, especially since it will put 
many photographers out of work, especially stock photographers. That's how Chelsea and I got our start. Adobe is already selling AI generated stock imagery and now it sucks, but a year from now, I think it'll probably be good enough that we'll be out of work. In other news, Sigma has announced three new lenses for Nikon. Well, they're not really new lenses, they're existing lenses that we've tested in the past that are new to the Nikon Z mount. But this is a pretty big deal, especially exciting because one of the elements of the Canon versus Nikon versus Sony Wars support for third-party lenses. Canon has basically banned all autofocus third-party lenses, meaning all Canon RF users, if you want to use a native mirrorless lens, you have to buy it from Canon. That limits their choices. So many people are pissed off about this. Nikon has a slightly different policy. Nikon will allow third-party autofocus lenses that do not directly compete with their own lenses. It's not as generous as Sony, which pretty much allows everything except teleconverters, oddly, but it is still some level of restriction. Nonetheless, these three new APS-C centric lenses by Sigma for Nikon are brand new, unique, and will give Nikon APS-C shooters some exciting new options. They are a 16 millimeter F1.4, which is 24 millimeter F2.1 and 35 millimeter equivalent terms, a 30 millimeter F1.4 equivalent to 45 millimeter F2.1, and a 56 millimeter F1.4 traditional portrait lens equivalent to 85 millimeter F2.1. This is so important for Nikon because Nikon has several excellent APS-C cameras and almost no lenses, especially no good fast primes like this. Like they have this amazing vlogging camera, but there's no lens to give you good shallow depth of field like what you see behind me here, but now there is. I'm shooting this on a full frame 85 F1 II, but you could get most of this look at a fraction of the budget using a Nikon APS-C camera and the Sigma 56 millimeter F1 IV here. So subscribe to see us test this because now Nikon can play with Sony and even Fuji to an extent in the APS-C cameras attached to high quality primes field. Hey, entire camera industry, you okay, bro? I've been worried about you. Ever since 2020, you haven't quite been the same. I mean, none of us have been the same, but you seem to have been really suffering. Like travel stopped, sports stopped, wedding stopped, and those were the three biggest driving factors for people to buy cameras. Are you bouncing back okay? Well, the numbers for 2022 are out. So let's look at camera sales according to LensVid that compiled this data for us. You can see if you look at the spike, camera sales of all interchangeable lens cameras peaked in 2012 with 21 million cameras a year. Oh, that was a good year for us to be sort of building up our YouTube channel, but it's been on a steady decline since then. Declining to 2020, where 5.2 million cameras were sold, since then it's been increasing. So naturally the pandemic, which stopped all those fun things people use cameras for, resulted in fewer camera sales. It has been nice to see things building up, sort of along the curve you would expect as more and more people go back to work, go back to regular life. And I feel like most of 2022 was normal for most people. And we see camera sales back up. Now, it's still nowhere near the 8.2 million cameras we sold in 2019. And I think if you were to forget about 2020 and 2021, you would just sort of see a pretty even decline down to 2022. So we're probably still overall trending downward in camera sales, but COVID was not a permanent setback for the industry, just a temporary setback, especially because all the camera manufacturers, but especially Nikon, who was really struggling, uh, adjusted their engineering resources, their sales resources. Basically they did layoffs, they did cutbacks, they closed factories so that they could be profitable in a smaller industry. Everybody that's still around today is prepared for these lower camera sales. So I'm less worried about the overall health of the industry. And I think things are looking pretty good going forward. How are DSLR versus mirrorless sales? Well, mirrorless sales are now uh, over twice what DSLR sales are. So this might surprise you. DSLRs are still selling, especially at the lower end of the market. I'm not surprised by this. Most people don't understand the difference. They wander into Best Buy or Target and whatever's on the shelf that looks cool. They grab it. Especially in 2022, most of those entry-level cameras were still DSLRs. Now, a lot of the diehards have since moved on to mirrorless. They insist on mirrorless. So that explains why they're outselling. How about lens sales? Light camera sales? Those are going back up too. 
This is such a relief to me because I have made the photography industry and the camera industry my life. This is how we pay our bills. And I was kind of worried that we might need to find something else to do if it continued to track down like it was in 2020. But things are looking up. I think everything's going to be okay. Our top story tonight comes from SonyAlphaRumors.com. Thanks. And it is rumors of a brand new Sony ZVE creator centric camera. But this is going to be their first ZVE full frame camera. So think of this as our A7S III here, but on a budget. Sony Alpha Rumors thought it might be called the ZVE100, but usually Sony uses one digit to mean full frame and two or four digits to mean APS C. So I'm going to call it the Sony ZVE1. But that doesn't mean that Sony is going to be consistent with their naming here because camera companies are not consistent with their naming. This is a 12 megapixel camera, which sounds terrible, except that is optimized for 4K readout. That means it will be able to do higher speed 4K for longer periods of time without overheating because unlike something like the Canon R8 with 24 megapixels, it won't have to combine 24 megapixels down to 12 megapixels in, in order to output standard 4K video. It will indeed film in 4K60 and 4K 120 with no crop. And we don't yet know how long that's going to be, but I'm guessing it's going to be pretty close to unlimited, like at least an hour of 4K60 footage, which none of the competitors can really match. That is none of the competitors at the price point that I think this is going to be at. It, like the ZVE10, I don't think this is going to have an electronic viewfinder. That hasn't really been confirmed, but knowing that it's in the ZVE family, that's sort of the defining trait. These are cameras with a flip screen where they will primarily be used with the flip screen flipped forward or by the camera operator behind the camera. So these are creator cameras. These are vlogging cameras that can do stills, but they are video first, stills second, sort of the opposite of what every other camera is. I expect it to inherit family traits from the existing ZVE-10 APS-C camera, which by the way, we really loved. I expected to have the nice mic on top with a little clip on furry or dead cat, they call it. I think it'll probably just have one SD card slot to help differentiate it from the existing FX3 cinema camera and the Sony A7S III hybrid camera. I think it will have no IBIS, again, to keep the price down and to differentiate it. And instead, they'll, they'll market Active Steady Shot. Active Steady Shot crops the video in a little bit and then kind of moves it around the frame to keep up with your movements instead of physically moving the sensor. And it's like a software where to do something hardware that can keep the cost down. It doesn't produce nearly as good results. We don't know the price yet, but I can take an educated guess. By basing it on the existing FX3 and FX30, which are available for APS-C and full frame. The FX30 is Sony's APS-C video centric camera and the Sony ZV-E10 is their consumer grade video centric camera. They have a lot of things in common, a lot of the same capabilities like a flip screen and no viewfinder. The FX30 is $1,800, the Sony ZV-E10 is $700 body only. So. If we take that same ratio of price and compare it to the Sony FX3 full frame cinema camera at $3,900, that would mean the ZVE1's price would be $1,500. This feels right to me because that is the exact same price of the recently released Canon R8, which also is targeted towards video creators, though leaning a little bit more stills creators. I'll compare those two cameras now. I think they're going to be the same price, but the R8 is 24 megapixels while the ZVE1 is 12 megapixels. So the R8 is going to be the better still scammer. It's going to produce higher resolution images. But here's the thing. People nowadays care less and less about resolution because most of their still images are being published on social media and viewed on smartphones. People are not making big prints anymore. 12 megapixels is just fine. That is what every smartphone camera has or at least defaults to. They both support 4K 60, but the ZVE-1 will do it one by one readout from a 12 megapixel sensor, about cropped down to about 8 megapixels in 4K video, whereas the R8 is reading a 6K readout from its more higher resolution 24 megapixel sensor, and then squeezing that down to 4K 60. In our tests of other cameras, including the Canon R6 and R6 Mark II, this produces better quality image. Those cameras actually produce cleaner sharper 4K video than the mighty A7S III with its lower resolution sensor. 
So why is the low resolution sensor considered an advantage? Because th those cameras, the 12 megapixel cameras are doing less work. They're doing less processing. They don't have to squeeze stuff down. Thus, they can last longer on a single battery. They generate less heat. They can record for longer periods of time. So for me as a creator, I use the a7S III for most of our videos. So I think the Sony ZV-E one camera will do 4K60 with essentially no limit, like maybe a couple of hours. Whereas the R8 is mostly limited thermally to about 30 minutes. It'll shut down pretty soon. That's enough for most vloggers, most creators. But if you were to record a soccer game, a wedding, something else, you might need to let it long, run for longer. And honestly, if you're me and you ramble on like I do, I need more than 30 minutes in a camera. R8 has an electronic viewfinder, making it a better hybrid camera. You'll be able to shoot wildlife with it. But ZV-E1, not so much. You always have to use the rear screen, which is okay for even portraits or landscapes or travel, but it's not going to be okay for sports or wildlife. Comparing the ZV-E1 to the Sony FX3, they're both full-frame creator-centric cameras with no viewfinder. Well, the FX3 is more than twice the price. It's rugged, it has a built-in cage, it has two memory cards, sensor stabilization, a built-in fan, so it can just basically run forever, and a big old XLR adapter with a handle that you can attach on top. It is a proper cinema camera designed for cinema professionals, filmmakers. The ZV-E1 is meant for creators, well, like myself, other YouTubers, people making TikTok videos who want a little bit of shallow depth of field, better quality, and it's optimized for those things to keep the price down. It'll probably have a nice mic, smaller form factor, and probably only a single memory card card slot, just a guess. And compared to the existing ZV-E10, the biggest difference is going to be the sensor size. I think they're going to be the same form factor, they're going to look a lot alike, but the ZV-E10 is APS-C. has many lenses, but there are many more full-frame lenses for Sony. You'll be able to get shallower depth of field, more of that beautiful bokeh than you could possibly get on an APS-C camera. So those are reasons people might pay twice as much and get the full-frame camera. And it's really nice that Sony is giving creators so many options. They're really, they're really leading this in the industry because right now, Canon, Nikon, Panasonic don't really have cameras that can compete like this. And they also don't have native mirrorless lenses in the same quantities and qualities that Sony has right now for creators. Like how many mirrorless power zoom lenses do these companies have? Power zooms are really useful for creators. So Sony is kind of ahead of the game in um, embracing those creators instead of sort of looking down their nose at it. They're treating video like a first priority instead of a second add-on. Like, okay, this is a stills camera, but you can also take video. Sony is really video first and moving down market faster than Canon and Panasonic are. And moving down market, getting prices down in the cinema industry faster than Canon can. We will have a full review of this camera as soon as it is available, so subscribe to see that. And thank you to our sponsor, Squarespace, who has made this possible for like eight years. We absolutely love Squarespace. Chelsea and I use it for uh, four or five different websites, including our portfolios for photos and video, but also personal projects that I work on. I'll start up a Squarespace website, create a custom domain for it, so it has some place to live that isn't controlled by the social media giants because I like to own my own content. I like to look professional instead of using a Gmail address. If that sounds good to you, head to squarespace.com slash Tony. Get a totally free trial. Just try it out. Make your dreams come true. Make your own space on the web and see how cool it looks. If you don't love it, you're crazy. You will love it. And when you do, use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off. Thanks for sponsoring us, Squarespace. Bye.